All right. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, yeah, as I was just starting to say, this week, um, like Richard's email said, we'll be following on with uh, last week's training session, touching on the basics of, of IPROX once more, getting the areas populated, copying over a standard and, and utilising all the standard notes associated. Um, those notes are there specifically to protect uh, you and us uh, and, and, and making it very, very clear to clients um, what is and is not included in uh, in that base price or in that estimate that's provided. Uh, we're fortunate enough that a few moments ago I was submitted a new design, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen. So I'm just going to minimise this. So as of literally two minutes ago, I was um, sent this design. It's a uh, potentially going to become one of our new standards. It, it's a very, very popular design over in Adelaide, uh, Metropolitan there. Um, and so I thought we might uh, spend some time and populate the uh, the IPROX details, make a copy of a standard, put in the areas, pick up the variances and, and do much of what we did last week. Um, beyond that, maybe next week, you know, um, if we don't get this one done in time, We'll then move on to something a little bit harder, and you know, as time goes by, we then uh, might start introducing uh, designs presented by others, and how we pick up the areas and 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 the like. And there's the very very um, particular things you got to look out for, like such as cabinet made vanities if they're not your standard, things like that. It's uh, while they may be a nominal detail detail from an architect's perspective, having a vanity shown on your plans with a basin step you know sitting forward is a potential liability for yourself pricing that as a standard because it's unlikely you're going to be able to purchase that product cost effectively uh, and and you'll be bound to then provide them a cabinet made vanity unless you've noted otherwise or priced that in so as you can see here it's, just, it's been drawn in Archicad just like the rest of uh, our drawings we've got our area schedule and all the rest of our details so just going to Minimise that for a moment and jump into our jobs database. So I think I might just reuse the test training job uh, that we used last week rather than uh, creating jobs every single time. And delete that out so I stop getting notified. And I'll just upload this at drawings here just so we've got it here for future reference. All right. So if we just load up IPROX here, you can see we've got uh, the preliminary estimate that we prepared uh, last week and, and the week there before. Um, so normally if this was a brand new job, this would be a completely blank screen. There'd be nothing there. You would have to go to new forward slash select and just create a new one or, or copy from an existing estimate, which is uh, certainly the preferred option. So if we just click here, tick this little box, copy from another job. And as I stated last week, um, you know, updating the standards is done on a relatively frequent basis. Uh, we're going to look at how we can communicate that better on, on the actual estimates themselves around the day they were last edited. Um, that's, that's in development. In the interim, if you just make the assumption that if something's been changed, it's logically going to be changed in the first one I come across, which would be a standard Avalon 191. If there's going to be a job that's up to date and reflect all the current notes and standards and inclusions, it's going to be the one that's on top of my list. So if, if you're doing a standard single story house and you're looking for one to copy over to, to start uh, estimating, which will incorporate all your standard notes, uh, I suggest you use that one there. So we'll just hit copy. And as you can see, it's brought everything over. First thing and uh, probably the most important is this expiry date. If we hit this three little dots, it'll reset it to 30 days from today. And then the second most important would be to adjust it to your relevant consent authority to apply the applicable loadings. Um, in my instance, 
well, we might just put it to something over in Adelaide for for a laugh. As you can see, I've got a huge number here, and uh, because they're all aggregated, I think the city of Salisbury is over there, so we'll just try that one. There we go, that's, that's brought that price down. So first and foremost, double checking the pricing model is the most current, which July 2016 was our most recent 1% price increase. And then we go about filling in these areas. Being a single story slab on ground house, um, it's rel relatively easy, um, just like for like. So living, lower floor, 111.98, 111.98, garage of 23.24, Kitchen of 5.46, wet area of 16.92. As you can see, these values here are adjusting um, to reflect any additional charges uh, that are applied due to uh, greater kitchen length or wet area size permitted per meter squared of living space. In this instance, 0.54 lineal meters or $590.20 and 5.07 meters squared or $710.21 have both been applied to the base price just here. Now if these values come in under the allowance permitted per meter squared, the clients aren't issued a credit. It's just effectively that they're not charged any additional. So uh, if you're doing a design and sell service, uh, and clients are trying to, you're trying to provide the, the most value for money and they've got a really big house, they, they're going to be entitled to a really long kitchen. So, so giving them that extra long kitchen they may not get otherwise, as long as it stays within the parameters, will be to your benefit. So if I change this to 311 just for a laugh, you'll see that uh, for that size home, the client would be entitled to an extra 4.54 linear meters of kitchen before there would be any, any additional charge applied. Um, now this house is entirely brickwork as we can see from the hatching around the perimeter and the fact that there is no notation here beside external perimeter listing the length of cladding. So we'll change that to zero. Um, the porch is 2.2. Now it's the only, only undercover living. The alfresco, if they did choose to do one after the fact, would be nothing more than a patio. It's not undercover space. So we would drop that back to 2.2 and the perimeter to 56.6 which also affects the price. So uh, nooks and crannies, turns, lots of sharp edges on the house, additional you know, uh, perimeter length will apply additional cost. So in this instance here, if this house was 111.98 metres squared with a 23.24 metres squared garage, that overall area, being 137.42, could be achieved far more uh, effectively if there was no turns involved, if it was just a straight perimeter, a straight rectangle. So as you can see here, it's applied an excess charge of 10.09 lineal metres. So it's saying that 10.09 lineal metres is, is uh, effectively wasted, uh, wasted length or, or additional complication that, that isn't otherwise required for a perfect home. So as you can see we have a base price. Uh, these items here have already come over from the existing job we've copied so they'll, they'll adjust once we get into the job work up in here. And we've got our fast track discount which is also shown just there reflecting in the overall price. So I'm just going to hit save and edit this estimate header here so it no longer says Avalon. Um, we may as well refer to it as the question mark, question mark, question mark job. And normally you'd adjust the design here so that it uh, prints out the correct design uh, on the actual job. Now, once again, we don't have a name for this, so it would be a custom. So 
we've got assumed dem, assumed n2, uh, soil test number we don't have. All these, these items here come across automatically based upon our preferred or most cost effective way of providing the house and what's allowed for in the base price effectively. Now, this job's in Adelaide, so I'm going to treat it as if it is an Adelaide job. They've got terrible, terrible soil over there. So I'm going to change this to assumed H2D. So the, the next thing to do would be to come in and obviously adjust the note to reflect that and also the site costs. So I'm just going to type in assume. Now, it's true, we don't have a geotechnical report and we've made a lot of assumptions, but what is not true is that we've assumed a type M. What we've actually assumed is a H2D and then hit OK. Further to that, we've got um, presumably the M-class slab item in here, which is not the case. It's a H2 D-class slab. So we add that, and if we just come back here and, tie, and delete that text out, we want to delete that M-class slab. And this area here will be the total square meterage of the slab that is to be poured. Now, in an instance like this, in a highly reactive soil type H2D, it's very, very likely that we'd use a polyvoid um, fully suspended slab system. And in that instance, the porch uh, would actually be poured in situ since it's uh, load bearing and carrying the roof. It would be um, quite problematic if, if it was poured as external concrete and moved differentially and uh, yeah, tore away from the actual roof structure. So we want to put this whole 137.42 in. If it was a, a H1, or an S or, or anything you know, there lower, then we would only be putting in the area of the living and garage because the other concrete, uh, our preferred construction method is to pour after the fact and not pour in situ. So we find it to be a lot cheaper than, um, than putting you know, waffles in and pouring it as part of the house slab. So 137.42. So that's added just you know, $10,300. $10, so I'm just going to go incomplete only, which is uh, effectively where I work most of the job, and then mark, right click and go mark complete, since I'm now happy that item's been completed. Um, as you can see, we've got a whole lot of standard notes in here which come across from the standard job. Um, now... Jane, can I ask you a quick question about the loading on the far right hand side, please? Uh, yes, what about it? So see how it says one, does it always have one against it? It does not. So it, if, if the uh, price level for the consent authority uh, in business contacts is less than one, then the master price list will, will not lower the price. So, so our master price list is, is what we state an item uh, should cost based upon our knowledge and isn't necessarily based around um, you know, minor adjustments you may see in some areas. So if you've got an area loading of 0.9 or 0.8, for example, you're not going to see these items appearing any cheaper on this side than they would if you were in Coffs Harbour where the loading was 0.99. It's only where the loading is greater than one that it applies a price increase. So if I just jump back here for a laugh and change this to say uh, Gunnada, which has a much higher rating, you'll see it's changed to 1.07, so it's now applying a 7% additional loading to each and every single one of these items, which is why you're starting to see things that are like 235.40. So it displays that price increase on screen. And the other way... So that means that effectively when you're in Adelaide, we're actually marking up the variation items there uh, higher than the base price of 0.94, for example. Exactly, exactly, it, yeah, exactly. So the, jo the, the job workup items will show at, at exactly 1.0 loading of, of the, the price set in here. Um, it's only where the loading is greater than one that it will apply a positive. Um, not dissimilar from these excess kitchen values where, where, you know, where if you use less than what is allowed, you don't get a credit. Um, we don't believe in many markets you'll find these products cheaper than what we've put in. If you do believe that you can source a product and supply and install it for a value less, then we encourage you to copy that item by right-clicking and going copy. 
adjusting the price and hitting OK and then it will appear in your database at your preferred price. So in this instance, this actual consent authority has a loading which is very, very low as you can see here from this base price versus changing it to Coffs Harbour. Um, but that's not having any implication on the line items applied in the job workup. So I'm just going to hit save. Thanks. You're all right. Um, back to incomplete only. Now we've got quite a few standard notes here which we're just going to go through and mark off as complete. These are the ones which, uh, which we retain in every single preliminary estimate which are available in the standards. So this double PowerPoint and NBN provision is, is just more a statement around the, the length of you know, conduit available and the like to reinforce our sales documentation around there being a provision for NBN. So I'm just going to go right click, mark complete. The energy report has not been done at this stage and any additional costs. Well, that's true. We've got nothing more than a plan. We don't have a BASICS and Nathers and ABSA. We've got absolutely no uh, no knowledge or, or of where this house is ever going to be situated. So, so it's worthwhile making that statement. There's absolutely no provision for any upgrades to meet local authority requirements for around or, or energy requirements. So mark complete. Now, clear glazed side light without transom to entry door. Let's have a look. There is not a side light. There's barely enough room for a door. Um, so we can delete that one out. So you can either right click and go delete or you can alternatively hit the red X, whatever is your preference. And then you've got to confirm to make sure you don't do it accidentally. So I've got owner to supply and install all external concrete after handover. Now, since I don't have a site plan and I've got absolutely no knowledge uh, of requirement to supply concrete or an area around that, then, then that's a worthwhile note reinforcing. So we just go mark complete. These timber posts, I believe there was one post shown to the porch if we scroll in there and it is a 90 mil post. Can I just quickly draw your attention to something I just noticed on the plan there, on the second page I think it might be, there's a little panel down the bottom right hand side for colours to be inserted, I haven't noticed that before, is that something new? See, that's, that's at external colours? You've, 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 you ask him too many questions. <laughs> it, is, it is something that we do internally, for, um, which is actually part of our, our template now. So we were finding... Um, <sighs> It was worthwhile getting our final construction set of plans signed by clients prior to actually starting construction. So some builders uh, who are attending this training may uh, take a different approach to, to colour selection and, and finalisation of plans and the like and may do many of those selections pre-contract. We take a different approach that you know we, we just want to try and get them in the door and secure them and get them invested without actually um, tying up too much of our own resources. Um, that's probably the case with having uh, being a large business and having high overheads. You got to do your best to get them through the door, get them invested, get some cash, and then treat them like they're you know, they're they're a real thing. So as part of that, we we have a contract set of plan. We've got you know round plans obviously where they pay us for a design service. Then that develops into a contract plan. Then that contract goes out to the client. The client 99% of the time comes back and still wants changes. Um, things that they discuss with the salesman on the day before they're willing to commit to signing it and they submit back a document called the owner request for variation form. Now that's uh, I believe on iGyro um, and we then process those changes, whatever they may be, they may be minor changes, they may be quite major changes and or alternatively we, we issue them a formal letter and state you know we're not going to honour this request whatsoever in accordance with the contract. We then turn that into a council set of plans, which is effectively the, the working set that we estimate from and the set that goes to the uh, local authority for, for approval. As you can see here, this would be effectively a contract or a round set of plans. Um, it's got little, you know, little cute pictures and, and doesn't have any sections or slab plans or, or, or information that uh, is probably overkill at the time of issuing a contract because once again the client hasn't invested too closely in you and hasn't hasn't paid the right kind of money to tie up those resources. So we, upon contract signing, 
we, we get a council set of plans complete. And what we've done is, is add this colour block on there so that we can start writing these colours in and, and getting them printed on the final construction set because the client will, will, will do their initial request to changes, we'll turn that into council, we'll submit it to council and then we'll arrange for them to have a, a, a colour selection consultation. And that consultation will be you know, completing the colour selection document and could be quite substantial changes or it could be very, very minor changes. So we take all the client's requests, the approved variations and the council plans and mark them up into a construction set which will effectively be the working drawings the home gets built from. And, and they could be vastly different from the original contract set or they could be almost identical. So what we do is we then get the clients to endorse and re-sign the construction set before we go to site, just so that there's no uh, lack of clarity about what's actually being provided, especially if they sign a kitchen set of plans with a cabinet maker and some other set of plans with somebody else and sign all these documents and they end up actually forgetting what kind of house they're getting or they think that they're getting things that, that have never been agreed to or may have been expressly declined. So this colour box was an extension of that. Effectively, we decided to take some of the, the, the external colours, which um, if were uh, delivered to site incorrectly or were not to the client's desire, could be quite costly to rectify. So we've started writing those onto the actual plans themselves and getting those endorsed simultaneously. So, so if the client was to sign these plans and that said the roof was wind spray or basalt or whatever it is and it came out something entirely different and the client started jumping up and down and screaming and whinging and bitching, we could refer them to the construction set of plans that they endorsed with that colour stated um, with a date more recent than any colour selection request or previous email or statement. So that's that's where this box has come about from. It's, it's something that we use internally um, to, uh, recently actually to, uh, to try and get the most costly stuff up colours on our plans because uh, there's nothing worse than having to replace a roof um, due to an oversight from estimation or, or colour selection. So that obviously took a lot longer to explain than you probably thought Richard. <laughs> so if anyone's got any questions about that or, or wants the guys to start yes, adding that correct. to them. Thank you for being so thorough. <laughs> If anyone wants those added to their plans, um, you know, just let Dan or Rich um, or whoever's doing their work know. Um, obviously, it defeats the purpose if you actually don't have the colours. So those are in there with the dots so that we can write that in and then they will be you know, printed onto the final working drawings. So, fingers crossed no wrong roofs go out. So yeah, we got a little bit, little bit off, tr off, <laughs> off topic there, but if we just jump back here, we've got uh, the standard note about there being two, two posts to the porch and one to the alfresco, or three in total. Obviously that was applicable to the Avalon, but not so much to this design here, which just had... Um, what if there is a variation to colour after the plans have been drawn? That is a very, very good question. We don't permit those changes. So once the client's been entitled to their colour selection consultation and sign that document, uh, I do absolutely everything I can in my power to not let them make any other further changes at all. That's... So, yes, um, that's <laughs> that. I guess that's the short answer and, and yeah, I guess we'll have to deal 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 with the, uh, the repercussions should that somehow get through after the fact. <laughs> Um, hopefully not after construction plans have been issued and endorsed by the client, that's for sure. Um, so we'll just edit this item here by double clicking it or alternatively right clicking and going to edit. I'm just going to change this back to say one. Post to porch as per plan and enter. Now there's no requirement for a length here because there's actually no unit price associated. The, the, the 90 mil posts are required for the load bearing nature of the home and are the most cost effective way of doing it so we don't charge them anything for that. It's just a, more of a notation to, to ensure that that's you know, what they're anticipating they're getting. So just going to right click and mark complete. Um, 
awning windows. We'll have a quick scan of the of the elevations and also the floor plan. So we seem to have one one awning here to this ensuite, and another here to this WC, and two to the bedroom. So we should be able to double check that awning, 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 and awning. Cool. So now we need to add up the areas associated. So by holding down the Windows key and pressing R, and then typing in the word calc, it loads the calculator. Like I said, you can use a handheld one if you've got one nearby. And we're just going to go 1.8, shift 8 for the star, plus 06. Oop, that's not right. 1.8 times 0.6. And there's two of those, three of those. One, two, three, times by three. So 3.24. And we can start up another calculator because these calculators aren't very smart. And go, well, 0.6, one times 0.6. Geez, I could have just done that. Um, so plus 0.6. So we've got 3.84. So I'm just going to kill those now. And put that in. And then right click and mark complete. Now we've got these three standard notes about the perimeter fencing, letterbox, landscaping. So no need to adjust those because in this instance we're not making any variance, we're not providing any of those items. So right click and mark complete. Same applies to the slab edge termite barrier. No one's communicated to me uh, regarding this job specifically that they wish to use a trithor or term guard or, or equivalent physical termite barrier system or a reticulated one. So so my assumption is it will be relying on an exposed slab edge, uh, which which isn't too difficult with a, a H2 class slab because they're like 400 mil thick anyway. So right click, mark complete. Once again, we've got no knowledge around temporary fencing requirements or earthworks, but by maintaining those items in there, they're a trigger should further information come to light after the fact. So that's why these items are sitting in the uh, the standards with zero value. It's so that when you do copy it over and you do have a site plan to refer it to or you know, more information than what I have on hand pricing just these standards, it's a trigger that you need to put those values in or make allowance for those because I guess they were consistently getting overlooked um, not only by myself but by others. So right click and mark complete. So one plasterboard niche to entry. So we just scroll in. Oh, just stepping back, um, if you hold down the control key on your keyboard and then roll a little mouse on the little uh, roll ball on your mouse, it allows you to zoom in and out. And if you do it fast enough, you can get dizzy. So just a little tip. And so we don't have any niches anywhere in this house that I can see internally, none to the wet areas, nor standard plasterboard. We do have a couple of square set openings, but we'll pick them up in a moment. So we'll just can that one. Ah. Then we've got one square set opening to hall and living. Now in this instance, we've got one that's, you could define it as the hall, or you could define it as the powder, whatever whatever suits. Or alternatively, you could refer to this as bed one or walk-in robe. Um, I'm probably going to call it powder and walk-in robe. So powder and walk-in robe as per plan. Now we're lucky the quantity is right, so we can just go right click and mark complete. Uh, now here's a note that does need adjusting on a case by case basis. Um, the note itself has been written based upon a standard, um, you know, four bedroom, two bathroom home. Um, if we double click on this, you'll see this here, it actually defines the wet areas and where we're providing the tiling. If there's actually any other wet areas in the home, then they need to be clearly noted. So for instance, we've got a WC and a powder, which haven't been specifically allowed for or stated. So we'll just write WC, powder, ensuite bathroom and laundry. And now that's, that's, that's reinforced to the client. So what they're seeing there is actually being provided. So right click and mark complete. 
Now, provide upgrade to cabinet made pantry. Now, the reason that note is there is to specifically uh, differentiate between carpenter made pantries and cabinet made pantries. Some of our standard designs show a framed out wall and an actual hume door uh, pantry, which would be carpenter made with carpenter melamine and you know, timber framing around the outside. It won't be your snazzy little, you know, um, boxed out thing, you know, with, uh, with you know, your fully adjustable um, clips. So that's why I'm adding that note there on some of these is to, to reinforce that these standards are ones where I've made allowance in the kitchen length to have the pantry work undertaken and where it's actually drawn as being part of the kitchen system. So this one here would be a cabinet made pantry, whereas our designer specification refers to a carpenter made melamine pantry. So that's that's why that note's specifically there. So mark complete. Now provide shower with no hob and or step down to bathroom and ensuite as per plan. So that's our standard construction method for slab on ground homes is to drop the wet areas and then bed them back up. And if we zoom in, we can see there's no hob on that shower and there's no hob on that one. And there's only two showers, so we're good to go. Then we've just got two of our other standard notes, the one that talks about us providing a design service and the other one reinforcing that this is a preliminary estimate only. Um, you would adjust this if you had some or you know, some of that information or if you had all that information, you'd, you'd delete it entirely. So we don't have a site survey or a geotechnical report, so mark complete. <coughs> now, this item here, the site costs do not include peering. Now this, this one's a very, very important note. Um, some builders provide an allowance in their base price for peering um, or, or go above and beyond to anticipate that peering may be required if they've got uh, further knowledge around cut and fill platforms. I've got absolutely no elevations. I've got no site. This is just a house in theory. And our pricing has made no allowance for peering whatsoever, nor do I know if this house is going to be on a cut and fill platform or be proximity to sewer or pools or anything. So just, just keeping that in, that's a very, very important note to manage clients' expectations because then when they do decide to invest in you and go to the next stage and they pay you a bit of cash to organise this contour and geotech, and the contour comes back, and or the geotech comes back, and the site conditions are all fine. It's an M class, everything's good to go. And then the contours come back, and you realise you've got to cut cut into a bank, and then you know move some dirt around and build a fill platform on the adjacent side. You can explain to the client where that cost has, has come about and, and why you've required peering all of a sudden. So, I'm just going to mark that as complete. Um, We've already adjusted this note here, and to the best of my knowledge, wind classification N2 is applicable. So, mark complete. Uh, once again, no importation or exportation of fill, just a standard note, mark complete. Now, these standard inclusions have yet to be updated. I only updated the master process a day or so ago um, to add our PGH login details and make them work properly. So if I hit word wrap here, you'll see uh, Angela and I have um, sat down and we've built up a, a standard brick selection. I think we spoke about this briefly last week. I've now got it uh, working correctly and printing correctly, which is what all that mumbo jumbo table jazz is that's inside this item. It's, it's aligning it so it's visually pleasant. Now that's not reflected in this job here because we've got word up and as you can see there's no nothing else in this. So I'm just going to wipe out these standard inclusions um, and just add the new ones in. Standard inclusions and integrity edge. As you can see you can add the items by just selecting the heading and pressing the green arrow. And there's our PGH stuff. So I'm just going to hit save go sales estimate for a moment. <coughs> and yes for line item pricing. As you can see, you know, we don't have any of these details because the client hasn't been set up and I just specifically deleted myself out of the sales consultant business contact so it would stop emailing me telling me to contact this client. Um, don't have a site address, that's why it's not there. We've got this snazzy little thing here, look at it. Looks gorgeous. 
And yes, ACT shares the same password as New South Wales. It is not a spelling mistake. Um, it's just the way it is. And that's how our website looks. If I hit this, it'll load up the website. And we will just hit my builder and type in that email address. Now this email address actually doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, it, I could write in any mumbo jumbo I liked or my personal email address. It's really, I've, I've only put that in there so that you don't have to try and explain to a, a client to put in their email address. Um, it, I tried explaining it, it got really, really confusing. They're like, but I don't have a login. Why would I put in my email address? So, so I just put that there as a visual cue effectively that an email address has to be put in. I don't care what it is. Um, INHNSW01, there's our beautiful display home in Corora on the main PGH website. If we log in, we should see our standard bricks. Now that's been put there, um, I guess, to reinforce the sheer number of bricks that we're offering in our builders range versus many other builders. Um, Except this here is specifically branded as Integrity New Homes Coffs Harbour. That, that's going to be changed to just Integrity New Homes New South Wales. And, and all this information here is going to be adjusted also as well as this. And it's going to be, those login details uh, are our company's login details. Um, you, you're, you're welcome to use those if you want to carry the same brick range, but you'll have to be aware that um, you know, the, the contact details and the blurb and logo associated will be reflective of... Um, of Integrity New Homes Proprietary Limited, not um, the whole franchise group. And if you guys wanted your own accounts because you wanted to carry different bricks or wanted to uh, brand that you know, yourselves locally, you'd contact your local rep to set that up. So as you can see here, we log in and we've got a phenomenally large brick range um, straight off the bat or for the client to choose, which is a lot more than I've seen from other builders, which is about these nine. So yeah, we just digress there for a moment. I just want to show off that cool little tool. Um, and if I just go back to incomplete only, I'm just going to go ahead and mark these completes. So they disappear. Now we've got these standard notes here about our service lengths and the locations. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the unknown locations of those service lengths. Um, and they don't need adjusting because I've made absolutely no allowance for additional services beyond the 10 metres and, and 60. So right click, mark complete. And if I just tick this calc bar, it'll show up the final little items. Now this cladding allowance is absolutely no cladding. So we just delete. Um, additional linen store or pantry. One walk-in robe, one robe, one robe, one linen. So this house has two linens, so that should be getting charged out. Now the linen is the same length as the laundry, which is 1.93. I don't believe there was any custom glazed windows or any special fixed glass ones or highlights or anything like that. So we can can that. Two-way switch, if we jump down to the electrical plan, we can have a look at it. Two, perfect. All right, hips and valleys. Back to the floor plan. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we don't count the ridges. So nine minus five is four. <coughs> Uh, windows and or doors. Now this here relates to the number of corners effectively where there's a window within 1200. I don't count two windows. I just, if they're both within, I just count the one corner. So it'll be one corner there. That there's not glazed, so that doesn't count. There's one there, so two, three, and that one there would be four. Oh, excellent. So now we've eradicated the history of the existing job and now we need to build this up to be reflecting what we've got on these plans. So I guess first and foremost would be this garage door. Uh, we spoke about the fiberglass doors historically and, and 
the reason that we prefer these doors to be aluminium glass doors or alternatively fiberglass doors, um, just due to the uh, warranty issues. So if we go flush smooth fiberglass and the fact that they're only available in 820, so if a client insists on 870, you'll have to, or larger, you'll have to direct them to an aluminium door for warranty purposes. So we've got one, two, garage. Actually, let me just step back for that. We aren't comfortable putting a standard block board or honeycomb door in that location. You're welcome to do whatever you like, but um, we've had quite a few fail in, in recent times, specifically in the northwest region where there's uh, high humidity and, and also here on the coast uh, where they've just been facing the wrong way and they've copped an absolute beating over two or three years and then we've had to replace the doors because they create a water ingress issue for the home and with the new six year warranty we've got to provide, um, you know, it's, it's just not worth it in our instance. So we can mark that off. So we've got the fiberglass, 820 doors standard. Well, they've got a roller door, which we actually don't do. So I'll clarify that with um, with the designers. Um, we've got the awnings, all four of them. We've got the square set, standard vanity, standard shower, standard recessed gas, hot water, one robe, square set. Picked up the extra linens, there's no bulkheads, there's only one, two, three, ooh, four external doors. So if we go additional and then hit the down, it'll bring up the calc bar where we added all those items recently after feedback and we've got the additional glass sliding doors and entry doors. So we hit one of those because we've now got four doors instead of the three. And two hose cocks, nothing else is necessarily jumping out at me, 22.5 degree roof pitch. Now that's applied to the entire, uh, well, covered roof area, which would be this value here as well, 137.42. Um, standard height roof. Now, I was reasonably convinced there was issues with 22 degree roof pitches and, and standard 2440 ceiling heights, um, but I will clarify that separately. Um, oh, it's colour bond. Overlook that. So provide upgrade to Colourbond Roof. Once again, it's applied to the entire area, the 137.42. And standard face brick, 90mm painted timber post, that's our standard. Um, Lighting plan seems quite basic and fits in with our standard inclusions of pretty much one light per room. Now this plan shows floor coverings, but we've specifically added a note confirming they're not included. So I personally can't find anything else on this design that um, needs noting or adding to this price. So we just hit save, there's our price. And if we hit sales estimate, we've got our final price list. Comes kitted with all our standard legal disclaimers um, and includes the additional expected uh, site costs, which you can opt not to do. Uh, you could always just leave it as assumed M, but I just don't think they'd have any M-class um, sites over there. So that's why I've gone in initially on the higher cost. So that's uh, effectively that house done. It's priced, it's finished. 
once you're up to speed and, and, and you're flying through, I mean, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to do this, this exact house in 10 or 15 minutes um, and just smash it up. But while I've got everyone's attention, if anyone, uh, unless anyone has any questions regarding this, I'd just like to divert to, to something else um, which Richard brought to, to mine and Dan's uh, attention probably a month or two ago now um, upon some feedback from a franchisee regarding the recent code changes um, to the Austra uh, well to the NCC regarding uh, downpipes and roofs and gutters. So if you bear with me one moment. I don't know if Richard would have that email uh, on hand, probably not because I didn't tell him about this. <laughs> Um, but effectively, it was a, a document that Stoddarts had sent out. If you bear with me one moment. That one. Here's one that I've uh, received just the other day from Steel Line, who, uh, uh, who we're looking to align ourselves with on a supply only basis and or supply and install basis on metal roofing. Um, I've sent this on to Dan and it Effectively, as of the 1st of May with the new NCC, there became some additional requirements and responsibility for pre-calculation of number of downpipes, size of downpipes, sizes of gutters, and all that's dictated by various rainfall measurements um, as released by the Bureau of Meteorology. And, and I guess the, the implications um, of not complying or not being aware of these changes. Now, I haven't sent this out yet because I, I, I was just going to get some feedback from you guys first before I before I acted on it in any way. But from what I can tell, there's uh, effectively a much greater onus and responsibility in ensuring compliance, which means researching your areas in terms of the rain flow, uh, rain, rainfall, one in 100, one in 20, and then specific design changes and, and, and equations which they detail here regarding how you then calculate the size of the downpipe or gutter that you need. Historically, we've just always rolled with our standard um, quad gutter 115 or 125 with 90 mil downpipes, and we've always assumed or we've pre-calculated for our the areas that we build historically um, to allow between 30 and 40 square metres of roof area per downpipe. Um, they're now going on to say that effectively if you're 30 or greater, um, you should be going to the 125 downpipe and if it's any more than 40, you may need a special box gutter to cater with those. Um, so that's a 125 slotted, so effectively it's got holes in it to let water out. Um, so uh, I just wanted to get some feedback from everyone as to whether or not they were aware of this recent standard change, um, whether they had any equivalent documents or discussions with their um, metal roofing supplier installers or, or, or just suppliers if they are aware of this change and, and how they think we should tackle it. So I've had some preliminary discussions with, with Dan and, and no action's been taken. Oh yeah, there we go. I, st I just sent to you from Stott Arts. Oh, champion. I think I got it as well. Um, oh, this is actually this is a different one, the one I've seen. Um, yeah, here we go. So new overflow requirements. So oh, this is from who did this come from? Stott Arts Queensland. So this is a different document to the one that I'd received previously. It was kind of a preliminary PDF that they'd propagated, but it essentially stated. Um, that they were going to make absolutely no allowance whatsoever and that they were leaving all responsibility with uh, whoever was ordering the materials. At least that's, that's how I recall the original document being stated. Um, stating for overflow volumes, yeah, here we go. We'll ask for a Form 15 and 16 to quantify the overflow volume of the slotted eaves gutter. So effectively what they're trying to do is prevent water from overflowing your gutters and thanks for that Martin. Um, and and making its way back into the house via the eave. So what they've done, many of them, um, steel line included, have come up with a special spacer, which effectively keeps your gutter away from your actual fascia. And so should it overflow, it's it's going to fall down. 
<laughs> oh, I didn't say you didn't listen. I said you just don't do what I say. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the water will overflow and will fall down in front of your fascia onto the ground rather than making its way back in through your roof. So, like I said, this is just preliminary discussion. I only just got this the other day and Dan and I haven't necessarily had a round table with, with management around how we're going to tackle it as a business given that there's um, potential risk there should there be non-compliance and, and, and you know, all new gutters being you know, included or additional downpipes required and the costs associated. So one idea that we have come up with is getting stormwater hydraulic designs done on each and every single one of our homes um, sometime after contracts are signed and before construction. So effectively our contract set of plans, which you know would not look dissimilar from this, would be devoid of downpipes but would merely have a note on it saying downpipes to future uh, hydraulic engineers detail and maybe write something up in our specification uh, regarding you know the fact that we're going to have to put them as per the engineer's detail which you know, may or may not be where the client prefers them visually which is why we have historically always included them on contract sets you know so that if a client doesn't want it on their front porch they know they've got to suck it up because we're not moving it. I've got concerns by stating the, the, the quantities and the locations on our contract sets. It's not necessarily giving us the flexibility. One dollar per clip. Okay, all right. Um, but those clips, uh, who's who's doing the calculations to determine how many downpipes you require, Martin? Um, I'm assuming you're using our design service, so, so the guys are probably using the same rates that they predetermined a few years ago for, for your market and would be logically working on the 30 to 40 square metres that they've used for us. And if that is the case, that there is there is risk there. And, and this is the short version, you know, that effectively, you know, um, you could require Round, you know, larger diameter downpipes or a greater number of downpipes than, than what we anti originally anticipated and drew and, and should there then be issues after the fact where you know it's found that it doesn't comply you could be found with quite a costly error. <laughs> no one's followed it up. <laughs> Love it. Well I mean, the, the, maybe it's going to be a bigger issue in Queensland per se where they've got greater rain, uh, anticipated rainfall events. Like as you can see, there's, there's some pretty um, pretty reasonable uh, rain levels here in these markets versus, you know, say Melbourne where it's quite piddly. Um, I think historically, uh, a few years ago, Dan and the likes uh, ran all these calculations on the rainfall information they had on hand and, and, and said, right, yeah, we'll work off 30 to 40 square metres of roof area and downpipes at a maximum of 12 metres. Um, I guess the issue with that blanket rule is it may not necessarily be the most appropriate in every single instance now that there's um, greater uh, legality and responsibility around it and, and specifically certification. Um, should your um, roof manufacturer and supplier follow our detail? Yeah, okay. Well, the other option um, that, that I'm looking at is perhaps getting a hydraulic design done in, on every single job. Um, we've used, I'm just going to load up this other one, we've used STA consulting engineers for our geotechnical reports in quite a few markets for, for quite a long time now and, and they've been proving to be very, very effective and it's one of their services that they offer, if I just jump to this job here, is uh, hydraulic design. And I'm reasonably convinced it was quite cost effective. So effectively, this is the we, we issued them a purchase order for this job here that we built in the, the northwest of New South Wales, which, as you can see, had a lot of really, really small roofs uh, with, with is potential issues around the roof pitches and the valleys associated. I believe um, anything below 10 degrees, from my recollection, with a valley requires to be engineered. So we engaged STA in this instance to do this one here and they provided a plan such as this that was fully detailed to comply and gave uh, the, the flow rates, the areas, the, downs, uh, the down pipe sizes. So in this instance here they said that we um, they actually put an extra two down pipes on than we originally had allowed and also increased each of the down pipes to 100 mil diameter which would be you know, your sewer grade pipe versus the standard 90 mil that we would use. 
and they've also made a statement here that should be no greater than nine meters. So, so this is one of the options I'm looking at invest you know, that I'm that I'm going to follow up in, in the coming days is, is is seeing whether or not this is something that they can offer and the certification that they can provide around that, um, confirming you know that it, that it meets these NCC gutter requirements and uh, yeah following it through from there and seeing what kind of price they can put forward on a, on large volume because it's entirely possible that. Uh, that Dan and I will be getting these done on every single one of our our builds. So I'll I'll report back in on that. I just thought I'd touch base on that if, if there was no if they've if you guys had dealt with this uh, previously or whether it was something you weren't familiar with, it's something that you might have to watch out for in the future. Um, like like I said, I'll I'll report back on this once I've got some pricing and some indication of compliance and the like, and uh, and let you guys know at that point in time. So if you guys are using us for a design service, um, it's entirely likely that your upcoming plans, I'll have to confirm this with Dan, but I thought I'd just flag this now, it's entirely possible that your upcoming plans may not detail downpipe locations, and, and that's that's why. But. Okay, uh, Jane, just a question yes. on that. Yep. Uh, can't we expect from the designers to do this calculation when we request that service through the service hub? I, it depends how much you want to pay them per hour to work out these these calculations. Some some things we can't actually design or engineer. Whilst we can work out the flow rates and, and, and everything, we may not be able to detail or engineer or certify the most cost effective way of doing it. As you're aware, you know, not dissimilar from wind classifications and the like, um, the engineers are, can can do a lot of things that you and I can't do, and can make a lot of assumptions and and follow a lot of different codes to downgrade things based upon their engineering principles. Now, we we would we don't have these these rainfall calculations for all areas. Firstly, that that's probably the first drawback. The second one is that we don't know at that point in time what size gutter or who your preferred installer is, um, what kind of gutter you're going to put on the house. Um, whilst we could make assumptions, if we do make those assumptions and don't clearly notate them and you choose to, to put a different gutter on, there could be implications there. If you decided the client came to you and said, I'd prefer a half round one, they look better, um, suddenly we could find ourselves in a really awkward situation. Um, um, yeah, Dad, but at least then the, a, a base has been established to say that these downpipes has been designed or must be installed and obviously if the, if the client or the builder deviates from that, their responsibility can't go back to the, to the designer. Um, if a designer is planned to be, to be designed for a specific area, um, the designer look at all the uh, requirements in terms of building lines and so forth. So is this, is this not just another aspect to look at? It, it, it is, but I, I'm concerned that the time associated, uh, and, and like I said, I, I've got to confirm this, you know, we're kind of talking off the cuff. I, I'd have to, cons uh, I guess, confirm that the cost and time associated with them doing this is actually in the best interest of them and, and, and yourselves. Um, I may be able to get a, a, a a firm price for these you know, hydrology designs, which um, you know, may be cheaper than what it would actually take our guys to, to work this out longhand method. I think mm. I think this yeah, one. Then... I think this one here ourselves. If you bear with me one moment, um, wasn't that expensive at all. Um, it was it was like two hundred dollars or something like that. It was so negligible it wasn't even funny, and, and, and I was shocked um, that it was so little money. Um, I'll have to try and find it and uh, and and dig it out. Like I said, I, I'm I'm going to pursue this. I've, I've spoken to Dan, and Dan's insinuated he's not comfortable doing it for our business where there's less risk. So I, I'd assume he'd probably be very very um, you know averse to then doing it on the behalf of you guys where it's putting not only us but, but using it in, in a position of risk. 
um, especially if I can unlock uh, the right price from someone who's geared and qualified to be doing these. So, uh, but we'll we'll come back to that. Um, so, it's uh we've run a few minutes over time. It, does anyone have any other questions? Not only regarding this gutters and downpipes change, but um but also on that uh, that standard design we're working on. Yeah, just on that standard design, um, that cost estimate or sales estimate that you've just done, yep. uh, will that be available somewhere if we want to go back and look at it? Uh, yeah, actually I might. Um, I'll rename it and add the word standard in front of it so it's available across databases. Um, bear with me a moment. Standard. So when you guys reload your databases next time, that will appear in your list. Okay, so stand at this time. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, Richard. Yes, sure Chris. Sorry, I unmuted myself. It took me a while to turn it back on. Oh. Yes, far away. Uh, Richard, uh, just back on this gutter thing. Um, we also need to understand what are the implications for us as builders when we use when we uh, use a um, plan that is designed by someone. Else else. Um, so I just want to make sure that we don't run into any any problems or risk. What do you mean by somebody else? Well, someone else bought the plan, a client bought the plan, and the plan is designed by uh, a third party. Uh, yeah, well, must they, went to court. they went to court, you as the builder are, designed, are deemed to be the professional, and you have to uh, consider the plan before you accept it. Um, so you'd be wearing the liability in general terms, unless there was some other set of circumstances that provided different information. Mm. Oh, I, yeah, I'm pretty much in, al yeah, in alignment with what Richard's saying. I mean, unless uh, architects these days, you know, they're, they're, they've got notes all over their plans covering themselves. Um, so they could draw something that involves sky hooks. It's physically not buildable. If you take that job on based upon that design, then then yeah, then and fails your life. I had a case with a with a client uh, or a franchisee several years ago where he accepted a set of plans that was provided by the client to him. When he went and looked at them more closely, i.e., after the contract had been signed, he realised that there was a 50 square metre error in the in the way in which the areas were measured, and he ended up, he took that to court and he lost. He had to provide the extra 50 square metres at the price he quoted. Because he's the building professional, he should have checked and known that beforehand. That's what the, that's what the court found in that instant. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so, so the bottom line is that we do have an a, a extra additional responsibility regarding this and we will have to be very careful around, around that. That's correct, and I quite like Shane's suggestion about getting uh, an expert in the, in the particular field to provide uh, advice on that because mm. it clearly needs a special skill set for this. It's not straightforward. Yes, but then um, when it comes to, to our preliminary um, uh, sales estimate, should we not then also have an, another note um, that specify that it is dependent on that kind of professional service. As in to what's been allowed for the downpipes, do you mean? Yes. In other words, if someone asks you to, to give a sales estimate, um, in many cases uh, you don't charge for that, for that. So at that point in time, you don't want to go to professional to get some feedback only after the client is starting to pay. That's right. So, so you, you you make them aware that what you that your pricing is based on a standard uh, allowance for downpipes, and I think the the specification already says that, doesn't it? So sorry, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, sorry. What's the specification say, Richard? Well, when you in terms of our general standard specification, there's a reference to about downpipes in there. There is, yes. So when we're when we're selling to people. Yeah, it's it, we're probably, selling on a standard specification, and 
It is. I'm wondering if we need to uh, perhaps have a look at the, the gutter component though um, and, and double check uh, the dimensions associated with that. Uh, I don't have the specification in front of me but I'm reasonably convinced it doesn't talk about 115 or 125 quad gutter. Um, it may but we'll definitely have to look into that because that's definitely what our jobs have been priced on. They haven't been priced on you know 150 mil whopping engineered gutters. Um, which the, the engineer, when he sees it, may come back and say, you know, unless you put six extra down pipes in, that's what you're going to have to do. And uh, at that point in time, you know, it's navigating that. Yeah, it just talks about that the gutter will comply with the BCA. It doesn't provide any dimensions or anything more than that. It's very pretty general. So that's probably needs working too, because I mean that there would would imply that we have to comply with this condition. And, and if the engineer or or the, the or this code dictates we've got to go up in size, then then we'd be liable for that versus being able to charge. So we may have to review the general sense of that clause and be a little bit more specific in exactly what's been provided. Which also means, to answer Chris's question, the way in which you go about doing the sales estimate, you just specify, for example, builder's range uh, gutter or downpipes or something along those lines at the mm. time. Yeah, which which we can certainly add add to some of our standards should we go down this route and start getting them designed by hydrologists or uh, whatever they're called. It's going to be noted on the plans, um, downpipes to future details, so it wouldn't hurt to, to reinforce that on the sales estimate document and uh, what time that's going to be ordered and uh, you know and the, the nominal size is provided. So I guess once we've got some clear direction on what we're going to do in terms of um, meeting the requirements, um, we'll then start working on uh, the standard notations and uh, yeah, legalistic clauses to protect us all from there. Yeah, thanks. That will, that will be helpful. Yeah, that's true, Martin. That's a good idea. Could be in the sales estimate is to, is to be done on an extra cost. Yeah, I mean, if, if you guys don't want to wear the cost of this, you, know, you can certainly add it as a line item. Um, you know, to your sales estimates, provide you know report and, and whatever it costs, or, or you could absorb it, uh, you know, similarly to a BASICS report or, or whatever the case is. Um, then we're not going to dictate how and if you charge for it. We just need to make sure that our standard documents are, are giving us the ability to uh, to charge for things should the, the the report come back unfavorably due to a, a complicated roof line. And it's definitely something that you probably want to be charging for when uh, when using other people's designs too. There's a, there's a great deal of risk there too with this new clause. If you do get a stupid roof line looking like this with things all over the place, um, it, it, it and a little technical term there. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also I also have this other one in my arsenal. It's called rubbish. Um, so, <laughs> so a perfect example was on this one here. We we overlooked the the implications. This is a very old job. And when it, this job finally came out of council and went time for construction, the, the code had changed, which is what necessitated this, this um, report. And as you can see, all the downpipes had to go to 100 mil. Now that may seem very, very minor, but you know, depending on what kind of roof area you're doing and the number of downpipes and, uh, and uh, yeah, it adds up. You know, there, there could be $10, $20, $30 extra a pipe and you add two or three extras and you know, you, you're, you're fighting to your margin straight away. So, so we'll reconvene on, on this one um, once I've got a bit clearer understanding and insight. And, and thanks for sending that through, Martin. I'm going to go try and dig out the, uh, the original one I got from Stoddarts and try and get my head around this and, and then we can have a further discussion around it and, and, and how we can tackle it as a group. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you all for attending and uh, sorry it ran a little bit late. I hope I haven't uh, yeah, cut into your dinner time. So, <laughs> I don't know what time oh, it is. Hold on, anyway. I'm going to have to have my little lunch later. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll see you all next week. You'll have to set up Naughty Corner next week as well, Shane. Oh, I thought I was in Naughty Corner. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Thank you.